Thank you for all attending this event. Um, we're going to start in about 30 seconds. I think they'll close the doors. Uh, just to make sure you're in the right, this is uh, making pizzas at home. Is that the right session? Okay. No, this is actually uh, modernizing government in the cloud. And for those of you who are upstairs at the uh, keynote, um, you know, I think we had about 5,000 chairs. I think there were over 3,000 people who attended. If you were wondering where all 3,000 people were, they were out in this hallway in between the last sessions. I, I found them. All right, let's get started. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Doug Van Dyke. I'm the general manager at Amazon Web Services for the federal and nonprofit businesses. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is sort of a follow-up on the CIO panel that was on main stage today. It's modernizing the government through the use of cloud. And I've got three, um, I'll call them expert witnesses, people who have been you know, on the streets in the DC government, working as either integrators, government, or both, helping the government innovate. So I'm, I'm assuming that most of the people who have been in the audience have been working in public sector for a pretty significant number of years. And what I think, and as have I, what I think is pretty profound and pretty exciting about what we have seen happen in the last four years is the amount of innovation that is going on in the government. And, you know, innovation used to be a word that was, uh, I don't know, a special right or privilege of the commercial world. And what we've seen the cloud do, you know, the ability to have unlimited access to the best technologies, the ability to do something small, fail fast, and course correct, is creating this new mentality inside the government, inside public sector, that people feel like they can try things that are new. And so we're starting to see innovation and modernizing not just be a right or a privilege of the commercial sector, but something that's happening inside the federal government. And it's causing people to think and act differently. And so I've, I've, we've tried to pick three of the best examples that, um, that are out there in the federal government right now. So let me start with introducing Sanjay Sardar, the CIO for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, also called FERC. Um, so Sanjay, do you <coughs> mind starting with just a quick, you know, five minute overview of what you're doing at FERC, how you've used the cloud to innovate, and what your long term strategy is for innovation? Um, no, not at all. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so my name is Sanjay Sardar. I am the CIO of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I am not sure if everyone knows what the FERC does, so I'll give you a, a, just a real high overview. FERC is an independent regulatory agency. We are under the DOE from a um, structural government structure, but we are independent because we regulate energy. The interstate transmission of energy uh, is what we do. So when you look at oil, hydro, um, uh, liquefied natural gas, and electricity, when that moves from one spot to another, that's in our purview. <clears throat> we create all the regulations. We look at the rates and uh, reasonability of all the things that are going on. Plus, we're also looking at the siting and security of everything that's happening. So for us, anytime energy moves, we're involved. Um, if there is a pipeline being put in your backyard, well, don't call me, but you can call the FERC. Um, those are the things that we get involved in. So there's, while we're a small agency, we have a lot of impact on all the things that are happening. At the FERC, we've taken a very aggressive approach to looking at the cloud. We're doing it slowly, but our goal, our long-term vision, let me start with that, is we would like to be in the business of managing technology to enable business success. We don't want to manage IT operations. We don't want to manage infrastructure. We don't want to manage pretty much anything IT. I'm probably talking to myself or any future CIO out of a job, but we want to be those folks who are actually looking at business, understanding what the business wants to do, and then finding technologies that fit in, not necessarily the people who are running servers. The cloud as a general platform has been, uh, as you said, in the last three years, 
it's been the best thing that's happened for what we've wanted to do. We have a lot of legacy applications, um, and I have a team in the room who's actually helping us do one of the major ones, that we are moving off from what the legacy platform was into a cloud structure. Um, looking at it that way, what the cloud has given us is, um, as you said, that ability to consume technology without having to spend an arm and a leg. I mean, uh, the cloud as a platform has enabled the as a service models, and we can take so much more advantage of that. Where applications that we used to keep in house and um, run ourselves and spend lots of money to maintain, to secure, we don't have to do that anymore. That's, that's the power that we're seeing for us. Uh, my goal in the next, or the goal of the FERC in the next uh, three to five years is we don't want any technology, we don't want to manage any technology in the, in, in, the, in house, and we would like to move everything off into a cloud-based platform. I think that's where we are. That's a good way to start, pretty profound. I've got a couple follow-ups for Absolutely. you, but uh, I want to hold those and introduce the next panelist, um, Jim Menard. And so Jim's a managing director at Accenture, and because of his position, he gets to see a lot of the different cloud implementations across the federal government. So my question to you, Jim, is are there good examples that you've worked on personally, and what are some of the best um, you know, case studies that you can share with the group on the modernizing of government or innovative thoughts with some of the customers you're working with? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jim Menard with Accenture Federal. Um, by way of introduction, I, I lead a technology practice across our federal business that we call IT optimization, and it includes advancing our work with cloud services and infrastructure and application modernization activity. Um, you know, we have actually been partnered working with Amazon since 2006 as Accenture, and we're very proud to be a, a premier consulting partner of Amazon's. Um, Along the lines of just sharing um, something that I'd, I'd like to touch on that Accenture and Amazon have had a lot of success with in partnering together to build is something that we call our Enterprise Application Migration Service. And this Enterprise Application Migration Service is a, um, essentially the, the, based on the lessons learned and the trials and tribulations and the successes of the last eight or nine years of working with Amazon um, to really come up with the best most repeatable process for moving to the cloud. And I'll touch on it real quick, and then I'll, I'll hit a success story um, to the question. You know, there are five major tenets to the, to, the, to the service, to the methodology. First, we start out with cloud strategy. And you know, can't, you've heard a lot about this, and even the panels that we've had over the last couple of days can't really um, state this enough, the, the need for strategy, the need to tie what you're going to do with cloud to a business outcome and tie it to the overriding strategy of your agency and your organization. Secondly is cloud assessment and um, the need to actually understand the applications that are in your portfolio and their readiness for the cloud. Uh, third of five has to do with the design of the actual uh, Amazon environments that you'll stand up and how you'll drive to fully capable and scalable capability. Uh, fourth of five, um, has to do with the actual migration process itself and testing. Um, and I'll speak some more as to what goes into that. And then fifth, cloud management. So cloud management gets into, you're going to wake up at one point and, and be really existing in a hybrid world of some sorts. You'll have some of your old uh, on-premise legacy solutions as well as some of the exciting new things you've, you've done with Amazon and others. And you'll need an ability to manage that. And you need to be thinking about that from the very beginning. So to touch on, Doug, your question with a success story that is very fitting, we just recently finished some work uh, with a federal home loan bank out in the western part of the country where we uh, essentially implemented that enterprise application migration service that we developed with Amazon. Uh, the bank asked us to come in and assess um, their existing infrastructure solutions and think through with them uh, how to successfully take advantage of the cloud. Um, you know, a, a story of a couple of months short, we essentially uh, worked with the bank to, in fact, cut over about what was 400 servers in their on-premise solution across about 50 applications to the Amazon cloud. It took into account work and, and movement from three different data centers. Uh, it's drastically cut their cost. It happened in a three-month period of time. Um, and one of the big things it did for them is they were coming up to the end of a lease um, expiration date, and they're going to have to make a pretty serious capital investment into uh, their next wave of data centers. And they've completely been able to take that off of their books as, as they've moved to 
the Amazon solution. So, you know, the, the, the enterprise application migration service is a, you know, it's something we've built together and it's proven successful and it's happening, which is the exciting thing, you know, here in the government space. Thank you, Jim. So Lena Trudeau, I'm going to introduce her twice um, because she's, uh, she's got two very significant roles. One, she's the former GSA senior executive that created the group uh, and managed the group called ATNF, which is an innovative uh, wing or group of consultants inside of GSA. And she was so enamored with cloud technology that she couldn't stand not working for Amazon Web Services. <laughs> So she has recently joined Amazon Web Services to lead our global expansion team. So Lena is on the panel both in two roles. One is <coughs> I'm going to ask her some questions about the work she did at GSA, specifically with regards to the innovation that was going on at ATNF. But second, uh, I think she's got some interesting insights about you know, moving from the government to Amazon and what some of the innovative ideas are that she can help bring back to the government. So that was a long introduction, Lena. Um, but what if I ask you to, for uh, your first part today, represent yourself as the GSA senior executive, <coughs> and what are some of the strategic things? I think 18F is a pretty profound change. If you could just elaborate a little bit on how that program got created and what the goal and strategy is of that group or the group inside of GSA. Sure, absolutely. Um, as in most changes, it was really an evolution that brought 18F about. When I first joined GSA, uh, and I was fortunate to be there in a non-political appointed position, which is a kind of a rare thing in my experience. But that allowed me to have some very strong working relationships right from the very beginning with senior uh, bureaucrats and public administrators who were also trying to make change, um, as well as uh, having the trust of the political appointees uh, who brought me in and so it was a really interesting role kind of just right between those two layers that, that in my experience anyway I hadn't often seen in federal agencies and when I when I originally came in um, uh, Martha Johnson the then administrator had asked me to stand up an innovation function at GSA and to work on innovating the business processes behind the way we did procurement GSA uh, through the Federal Acquisition Service procures about $55 billion worth of goods and services every year, and they were really struggling to get good data about those procurements, to understand unit cost. I mean, really to answer the question, am I getting a, a good deal on what I'm buying for other federal agencies? Um, so that's a long way away from running a DevOps shop inside of government that serves other government customers. But what happened along the way is uh, both a change in administrator and uh, at the time, Todd Park had started up a program called the Presidential Innovation Fellows at the White House. And they had brought in, in their first round, 18 designers, developers, entrepreneurs who, uh, whose mandate was to work in very short sprint cycles paired with very experienced uh, government employees to drive change quickly inside government agencies. And, um, and as I said, there, was eight, there were 18 of them, but that was really, really difficult to manage out of OSTP, which, which really doesn't have a platform for being able to run you know, operational programmatic things. So uh, Todd Park asked Dan Tangerlini, the next administrator of GSA, to take the program over to uh, the General Services Administration, and Dan asked me in my innovation role to transition that over. So as we transitioned it over, waded through, I think we had over 3,000 applications for the second round of Presidential Innovation Fellows, and uh, selected 43 and tried to hire them. And so imagine, right, within about three months, we learned we were transitioning the program over, we, we evaluated thousands of applications, we identified through a, a pretty rigorous process uh, 43 candidates, we extended offers, navigating the hiring process along the way. Throughout everything I had done up to that point, in government, uh, from the, the procurement work through to this program, systems made everything harder. The technology that we used made everything we were doing more difficult, not less difficult. It was really, really insightful. Um, talk about one of those profound moments. So then I think the icing on the cake really took place when the, the first of these Presidential Innovation Fellows really hit the ground running. They were in for either six or 12 month terms. They were expected to start you know, really working very hard right at the beginning. Uh, and we wanted to have our first MVPs available within 30 days, but we didn't 
have the ability to, to give them a platform on which to do that work. And so that's when I first became a customer of AWS. It was interesting to juxtapose the ease with which we worked in a cloud environment versus the difficulty with which we had to work in a legacy environment. Fast forward to um, the, the crisis that was uh, healthcare.gov, which was such an unfortunate incident in so many ways, but there's no cloud that doesn't have a silver lining. And what that did was give us the case for change to take a set of the Presidential Innovation Fellows that were about to roll off their tours of duty and offer them full-time positions and create the organization that's, that's called 18F. Because we realized we didn't just need a, you know, a rotating fellowship, although that in itself provides a lot of value. We needed a cadre of really smart technologists with that entrepreneurial bent and real um, uh, sort of expertise bootstrapping things to be able to bring a different approach to the way we were thinking about building applications particularly, but technology writ large in the federal government. And, and it, was, it was a really interesting change initiative all along the way. It would not have been possible without cloud. There's no way any of that would have been enabled if we didn't have access to the cloud. Thank you, Lena. So, Sanjay, I want to come back to you. Um, it has been my personal experience that there are two workloads that uh, are quickly identified as cloud ready in the federal government. The first one is any new development. Mm -hmm. The second one is anything that has failed or is broken or the, you know, the, the risk is already there um, and there's an appetite for trying something different. Now, you talked about a migration to the cloud, uh, migrating you know, potentially your entire infrastructure. There are legacy applications. Mm -hmm. what, it, what do you do with, okay, let's, let's say that, let's take the, for granted that the new development and the broken things are gonna be moving to the cloud. How do you handle the rest of the infrastructure? Um, so when you look at infrastructure overall, when you say there's legacy applications that exist in the cloud, I think Lena made a great point, which was some of these applications are making jobs harder. They're not really helping people to get done what they need to get done because they're done in a, in a model that was built long, a long time ago. Workloads have changed, how people work, how people interact has changed. So the legacy infrastructure is not keeping up. Now, when you say how do we migrate legacy, I think it, everything's gonna be a culture change here of how we work, how we work today. When looking at these legacy infrastructure or legacy um, applications, I think the biggest thing to do is understand and dissect the business processes behind it. Looking at those business processes accurately, if you can figure out what they're doing, it's actually not a big jump to say, okay, look, we're gonna migrate these things to the cloud. Obviously, you have to take into all the, the good DevOps practices that, you know, that happen. Um, one, of my, one of my things that we're doing right now is we're migrating the heart of our uh, file, file system, or not a file system, our records management system, all the records that we keep at the FERC over to an Amazon cloud running on IBM's uh, FileNet. Um, that migration, we're actually going from a FileNet to FileNet in the cloud type scenario. Even that migration, we're seeing so many challenges with, well, how do we keep it running and moving, at the, and moving it at the same time? But it's very possible. Uh, understanding what the business processes are. I mean, the team that worked on it, if I can give them a quick plug, IMC, they're sitting in front of me, so. Um, team that works on it, they're actually doing a very good job of saying, look, what is it that the business user actually needs? You know, it's not the technology, it's not the underlying legacy technology that they're actually using. They're saying, okay, I need to search for things, I need to edit documents, whatever the case might be. And then translating that into a cloud model, and then the culture shift of managing your user base to say, look, it is a change. This is why we're doing it. We're, we're looking at cost savings. We're looking at redundancy, which is a huge thing. Some of these legacy applications, if, if we had a, funny enough, the FERC had a power outage um, a while back, which um, when we looked at our legacy systems, we didn't have the adequate redundancies that we needed. The cloud, the, the platform that's there, moving things there, when users start understanding, I'm never going to go down. I'm never gonna have to worry about, oh, 12 o'clock at midnight, I'm doing something passionate. Those kind of innovations, as you put it, um, as simple as they are, they, the users will automatically start saying, okay, why aren't we doing it? Today, we're actually getting a lot of our users coming to us 
who we've taken a lot of time to educate them on what the cloud really is, why it's important, what the benefit is, and laying out a plan of how we're going to move one system at a time or multiple systems at a time, um, they come to us and say, why can't we be next? So I think it's, a, it's an education process, a less of a technology challenge, and more of an education process to, from the culture side. As long as the business process is met, as long as they're getting what they need, I, I don't think there's a, big, um, there's a big challenge, but it's not insurmountable. So Jim, we talked about identifying those applications that are going to move, which ones move first. Um, you're not ever going to be in a situation, I think, where everything migrates all at once and you go from a completely on-premise to a completely in the cloud, unless you know, it's a small enough organization that can do that. So there's always going to be the, you know, the one foot over here, one foot over here. How do you manage having you know, multiple, you know, an on-premise and a cloud, a hybrid environment, what, you know, and Sanjay talked a little bit about the DevOps. Is it, can it be consistent? How do you manage this process in having a hybrid environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I have to take the opportunity to, to jump on something Sanjay talked about. I mean, from an education perspective, when we work with our customers, that's absolutely the way to success. Um, a lot of the panels and discussion this week have been about security, for instance. and. When we work with our customers, it, it is never the technology side that scares them to death. It's, it's the, the change, it's the, the lack of, a, of an understanding of, of how security should work, for instance. And the, you know, the model that Amazon has created around the shared services and the, and the breakout of security between what the customer owns and what AWS owns, what you know, is the cloud, what goes in the cloud, and who owns what, it clearly defines roles and responsibilities and you can make an absolute ton of sense of it, but you have to educate and you have to get people comfortable. So I love that you're thinking that way. Um, hybrid cloud management to the question. You know, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about that exact challenge because there's a lot of excitement about movement to the cloud and taking advantage of, of all that is. Um, where you're going to ultimately be left will in fact be this sort of mixed breed and this hybrid existence. Um, we have put a lot of our investment in thinking into something that we call our Accenture Cloud Platform. And you know, it is a platform that allows for hybrid cloud management. It allows for a single pane of glass, if you will, to look across all the environments that you land on needing to manage. Because you're gonna have some success with the public cloud, you're gonna have private, you're gonna have some of your on-prem legacy. And you have to be able to pull those things together. Um, operationally, I think the, the biggest piece of advice we give when we move to things like that cloud platform and we, we create that ability to control and govern, even when you've got a mix of different infrastructure estates, is really to not create new operational silos. Um, you, know, you, can, you can have a lot of success moving to the cloud, but then you wake up one day and you've just created new silos for yourself. You've got, with every environment that you have, you have a different way of managing. So, you know, that's, that's one of the big elements of hybrid cloud management. Think about it from the beginning. It was in my enterprise application migration service I talked about earlier, that was phase number five. But then once you actually start on that process, make sure you're not creating new operational silos. Keep standard processes across all the environments, standards tools that you're gonna be using. You can train your people one time. Um, so just a you know, recommendation when, when we think about hybrid cloud management. Thank you. So we've talked about assessing, migrating, operating. Now, how do you access the cloud? So I'm going to ask a think big question. Um, some of our commercial customers uh, have a view of operations where every mission application is virtualized and any device is allowed access. Can the government get there? Why not? You know? How do they get there? Yeah, so um, I think these, these sorts of, uh, these are very difficult things that government agencies struggle with because it's not just about the technology. And, and you, you've heard my colleagues on the panel talk about this in different ways. It's not just about the technology. If it was just a technology question, that's easily solved. Um, it's a question of, uh, you know, what, what are the business processes and practices that have built up over time uh, what are the policies that exist that may need to be changed? And in my own experience, I often dealt with policies and documented practices that when you look back through 
uh, you know, years of layering things on created sort of a conflicting mess, really, um, that had to be sorted. Uh, the, the business process reengineering piece that Sanjay talked about is critically important. Um, the procurement piece, how do, you, how do you support through procurement, uh, you know, a lot of different options and models. Moving just, just to the procurement of cloud in and of itself, one, you know, one technology shift was um, a significant investment in time and generating more understanding. We did a lot of market research. We talked to a lot of different vendors. Um, and then when you get, I mean, when you're talking about proliferation of devices, there is a question you need to ask yourself about how much complexity you really want in your environment to manage. But that's a business decision, right? So if there's a business reason to support a lot of options, um, then you figure out what sort of frameworks you need to put in place in order to do that. Uh, but good. it's a journey. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm eager to see us get there. <laughs> um, Sanjay, so uh, I'll, I'll close on this initial round of questioning. So let's assume we're in the cloud. You're in the cloud. What are the benefits that your organization have seen from moving there? Are, are you realizing, you know, there was an intent behind the moving. Are you realizing the benefits behind the intent? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think I'll, I'll take just the simple mission critical application of email that we, we migrated to two different sets of clouds. Um, but, uh, Almost immediately, if you look at what we're doing, uh, we'll talk from multiple, from the operation side of things, we, we're so much better at operating email in the cloud, in a cloud instance, that we don't have to do so many of the same functions that we used to have to do. We don't have to worry about redundancy. We don't have to worry about, we, we've done a really good job with single sign-on security with um, integrated into everything we do. Um, we don't have to worry about the security of things. We don't have to worry about remote access or access from wherever. We're looking, I mean, when we talk about proliferation of devices, that's been one of my mantras for a long time, any device, any time. I and mean, why can't we do that? We should be able to do that. So we're focusing on things like that. Cloud platforms, cloud applications, cloud technologies, they all kind of lead us down that road. We're in a world where everybody's connected all the time through either their, their own personal cell phone or through uh, government or industry provided um, equipment that we, we need to be leveraging that. We need to be using those things. And that's where the real true benefits come in, not only from a cultural aspect of, you know, my 16 or now 12 year old daughter who acts 16, um, mm -hmm. texting all the time, collaborating on things like Snapchat, Instagram, whatever there is. We should be looking at those models and saying, how do we incorporate that into the business process and work that we do? And how does that play out? And cloud lets us do that. So we've already seen benefits from just pure operations. We're going to see cultural benefits because people are going to be more accepting and easier to use it. And down the road, there's going to be new uses that we don't haven't even thought about. I'll give you a great example of one that, you know, I was just, you know, the iPhone, you guys, have, everybody's taking a picture with it, right? You save it up to wherever. My son, the other day, he has glasses, forgot him. He's eight years old, took out the iPhone, zoomed it in, started watching. Someone out there on the camera because he didn't have his glasses. So, the new tech, the kids and the youngsters, the way they're using it, we got to start thinking about how do we use that into what we do and how our businesses are. And we're going to le absolutely leverage the benefits of the cloud. I think we've already seen it. My budgets, it's not a fun thing, and the government has already <laughs> shrunk. But, um, but we can use the money for other things now. Now we can truly use the money for things like um, answering business problems and not worrying about the technology and how it plays out. So. Can I add something real quick to what please, Sanjay said? Please. I actually think Sanjay gave a better answer to the question you asked me than I did. Um, but it, it, it occurred to me while you were speaking that, um, and, and I just did it too, that the tendency in government agencies is always to think about what we're able to do given mm -hmm. our skill sets and our infrastructure right. and our environment and our regulations and our policies. And I just spending some time with Liam Maxwell this morning, we just need to, you know, he reminded me, turn that inside out. What do the users need? Right. Our mission in government is, you know, is so, it rests on our ability to govern as a nation, rests on our ability to engage with citizens and stakeholders and businesses all across this country and frankly around the world. And if, they're, if we think first about their needs, then we will find a way to any device. If we think first about what they're really looking to do and how they're looking to engage with us, we will create applications and ways in to work with us that are very, very different than they are today. 
So speaking of doing things differently, Jim, you, we've been doing some exciting things in the government that we've talked about, but I know that Amazon and Accenture have been working in the commercial world too. Are there any good examples of our partnership in the commercial world that you can share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's pick one with a brand that you'll know. Um, uh, Discovery Networks International. So um, everyone knows the Discovery Channel. Um, your very smart eight-year-olds, I know, knows the Discovery Channel. Yes. Um, you know, we uh, recently, over the past year, worked with Discovery Networks International. They're, they're uh, actually a massive um, broadcasting and content uh, delivery organization. They support um, 220 countries and over 45 languages in the content that they disperse. And they had a lot of challenges with um, inability to stand up new sites to deliver content uh, in a at speed. Um, they had a lot of challenges with how long it took to actually provision new infrastructure, to actually take on new requirements. And they came and worked with Accenture. Uh, we did an assessment of their existing online uh, capabilities and infrastructure. Uh, ultimately moved their entire portfolio of applications uh, for this massive organization to the Amazon cloud. Uh, so a huge success story. Um, they've actually cut their operational costs from an infrastructure standpoint by 73% year on year, which is just amazing. Uh, they too, uh, like uh, one of the success stories I mentioned earlier, have made, have been able to take what was gonna be a capital expense, uh, expense right off their books uh, as they've moved more into the cloud. Um, they've realized uh, a, a whole new ability to um, develop applications in a much faster way to enable them to get new content to their customers. I mean, 1.6 billion customers worldwide, and every bit of it now is in the cloud. So, you know, it's a fantastic story commercially that I think we can learn from here in the government as well. Good, well, that, that's exciting. Um, I'm gonna ask Lena one more question, and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience for questions for the panelists. Lena, this is the question that I was alluding to at the beginning. Um, you've now been very recently in two roles, one inside the government and one inside Amazon. Knowing what you know in the, you know, the months that you've been here, what innovative thoughts, ideas would you bring back to the government if you were still in your old role? Oh gosh, so I think first of all, it, um, it really takes partnerships. And, um, and I saw that when I was inside GSA because I, I partnered really, really closely with a couple of business leaders inside the organization and with the CIO. Uh, but from the outside in, I, I think I really understand the deep importance of ecosystem in a different way. And uh, when you look at what we provide at Amazon Web Services, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really robust platform. There's no doubt about that. But uh, it wouldn't be what it is without all of the software developers building on top of it and creating really useful and scalable applications and, uh, and a lot of the tools and um, you know, assistance that come from partners and, and um, uh, some of the innovations that come from customers themselves and all of the feedback that goes into our roadmap. Th that ecosystem is something that is you know, a really virtuous cycle. When I talk to governments all over the world, they're not looking at cloud as only an opportunity to you know, lower expense, get some CapEx off the books, think about you know, leveraging it to do some business process reengineering, moving things to the cloud and making them more available. The, the, the agility piece, the flexibility piece, all of that's in there. But they're also looking at the fact that with the adoption of cloud comes uh, you know, greater support for an understanding of an uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And uh, that when they really embrace cloud and put a lot of government workloads, particularly in the cloud, then new kinds of small and medium-sized businesses spring up to act as partners in our ecosystem that can serve those customers in the local market. And uh, there's, uh, there's opportunities for education and training that allow graduates in all places all over the world to graduate from you know, university and increasingly even high school uh, ready to work in a cloud-based economy. I mean, these are things that people who are at senior levels of government around the world see 
the US taking advantage of. They see places like Singapore and the UK that are you know, really increasingly adopting cloud, benefiting from, and they want that too. They see a real ability to move their workforce up the value chain and get them out of the undifferentiated heavy, heavy lifting. So I think if I was to go back into government, I, I would take a broader view and I would really work hard to develop a much more robust ecosystem. Sanjay, it looks like you had a follow-up thought on that. Yeah, no, I mean, again, I just want to, th that was a great point in the sense of, but, I mean, not but. I want to add one thing to that that actually makes perfect sense. As the cloud gave us this ecosystem, it's not only the new companies that are being formed, all these companies that exist today, all these technologies, they're being forced to innovate as well. I mean, where we're saying, look, the government is trying to do all these different things, if we're already taking those steps, companies that don't work together, that don't interact well together, or don't, whatever the case might be, their technologies don't work, they're going to have to interact because now it's that platform is set up. So that ecosystem is perfect in the sense it also forces everybody else to kind of rise with that tide. So I think, I think it's a great point. All right, now I'm going to challenge the audience. So you've got three government innovators up on stage. Does anyone have a innovative question <laughs> modernizing the government uh, that you would like to ask the panelists? Sorry, it's hard to see all the hands go up at once. <laughs> I can continue. All right, let, let me ask another one, and I'll throw these out uh, to the panel. So securing the cloud. So with this bold move into a new frontier, security paradigms change. How do you look at your organization's move to the cloud in the way that you secure your network, your applications, your infrastructure? Any thoughts, Jim? I'll start. Yeah, you know, I touched on this a little bit before, the shared security model that uh, Amazon has established. I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, but I think it also concerns a lot of people. Um, when you think about what the cloud really is, and this is part of the education part that Sanjay touched on, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation, the compute storage network, the database, that's what Amazon secures. Everything on top of that from the operating system, the application, and the data, a lot of that can stay the same as what you did when you're on-prem. You're just now in the cloud. So there's this integration and education that has to happen. Um, there are many that will say, and I've heard a couple of panels in the last couple of days here, that would challenge that you know, what we're doing in the public space from a security perspective is actually uh, leaves the customer much better off than their, than their on-prem solution. You know, if you get hacked in your on-prem solution, uh, the bad actor gets everything. You know, if, if, a, if a bad actor hacks into, into a cloud environment, they're going to get bits and pieces. Um, I'd also say that from an innovation perspective, I'm impressed. I mean, Amazon does an absolute ton of innovative thinking. They listen to their customers. I mean, this obsession with the customer that Amazon talks about. I really see it come through from a security perspective. You know, when you see something or get some feedback that you're not, you know, the encryption for databases doesn't work quite as well as it should, hey, you guys jump right on it. So um, innovation is playing a huge role. Education plays a huge role. Sort of getting comfortable with the roles and responsibilities and to know that it can be done. Um, from a security perspective, um, you know, you should be pretty comfortable with moving to the cloud. So what is the most innovative thing you have seen the government do? Can be at your agency or it can be at any agency. What's the most innovative thing you've seen the government do or a very good example of an innovative thing the government has done? You work with 18 enough, you might have a better example. <laughs> well, I, I can't say that. Um, that would be self-congratulatory. No. Um, you know, I, do th I actually do think that standing up uh, a DevOps capability inside an agency is something that shouldn't be the purview of GSA alone. Every agency should do it. And to me, the value of it goes way beyond having some uh, you know, really good technology chops inside the organization that, that are really more, uh, more modern. And among, among government employees, I, I worked as a contractor to government myself. I think contractors are an important part of government as well. But from my years as a consultant, I learned pretty quickly that if you don't have a smart client, you're not going to do the best work. The best 
the, you know, the best outcome happens when you have really smart, very innovative, very aggressive customers who want to work with the best support in terms of you know, their, their uh, contracting environment. So I, I think, um, I think for, for that reason and also because what, when we adopted lean and agile approaches to development and we started thinking about business problems in a very user-focused, user-centric way, it, it caused us to bring people together it, right at the beginning as we sought to solve the problem. And so you had, talking about security, you had security and IT and the business and procurement and finance and legal at the table right at the beginning. And that it goes a long way. I just think you end up with better results rather than trying to automate a bad process that you haven't really dug into. You end up with, um, hopefully the MVP of what a process that answers the mail would look like. And so I think that should, I think that should be everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to stress, innovation is the, the largest innovation is, I think, less important than the fact that everybody is innovating. I think every government agency today, if you look at just the change of thought that's happening, just what Lena talked about, people are trying to get people together, you know, um, get all the different silos working together towards the, uh, purchasing correctly, towards developing, rolling out correctly. That innovation of process for what the government is doing is probably very heartening right now because that's not something we've seen in the last uh, however so, many uh, years. I, I want to ask a question on that. Do you? F it is changing, and I it's think changing. that yeah. federal employees five years ago didn't feel empowered to innovate. Yeah. Do you feel that that has changed? I mean, I, I've I've met a lot of people who are innovating, but are they empowered to innovate? So, risk tolerance. Uh, federal employees in the last uh, whatever, however many years, when you make a big mistake or when you make a mistake, Congressional Hill, you're up on the hill, you're doing anything that you can, to, you're protecting yourself. So risk tolerance was a lot lower. I think the change of, this change of discussion that we're having in the industry or in the tech community, the CIO community, even in the business community and the government of look, fa the, the concept of failing quickly and failing fast or failing fast and uh, failing often that's a, that's a mantra that wasn't there before. So I think the federal employee, given the tools of cloud that where you can consume in little chunks and then fail quickly, if you will. Um, yeah, I think it is starting to say, we are starting to see, yeah, you are empowered to take risks. Now, again, at all levels, I think there is a level of uh, a risk that we haven't still crossed. It's never gonna be Silicon Valley. We're not gonna be up there because this is public taxpayer money. We have to be careful with what we're doing and how we're doing it, so we're not wasting it. But I think those little, the ability to do it in a, in a small environment rather than, um, uh, Roger Baker at VA once gave me a great example. He was, uh, he was doing a pilot for something, uh, and I won't say what, but his pilot cost him over two and a half million dollars just to do a pilot for X number of users, and I, I'm not talking a lot of users. Now we don't have to do that anymore. Now we're much better off saying, okay, a pilot can be $50,000, a pilot can be um, $100,000, whatever, something a lot smaller. $300. And really, $300, $300, right. The Free very tiers. first yeah. piece of software, the first Easy. PIF delivered after 30 days was Sean Heron. He was working with the FDA. He took a whole bunch of data, yep. uh, disparate data sets on adverse drug reactions, and $300 worth of Amazon Web Services got him to an MVP in 30 days. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a very senior architect in our group who used Amazon and set up a whole shadow network and showed us how we could do everything we're doing in a, in a different way. But you're right, those are the things that now the cloud has given us the capability to do. And it's at a price point that's much more realistic and much more um, easy to justify. So. Can I add so, one more thing to that? Yeah, yeah, so, please. Um, We've got really three excited. minutes. So, so first uh, of all, the $300 was the very first monthly bill we got to support all the PIFs. So I'm totally <laughs> overestimating that. So it was less. Um, but ha, you know, looking across government, it's it's so hard to pick one innovation because yes. you have people now making decisions about agriculture policy based on the ability to mash up you know, satellite data and weather data and climate data. Sure. You, you have, uh, not, not to mention, uh, you know, the genetic data that's available now. We're onboarding rice genomic data into AWS to be able to support research into you know, food production. Um, you have NASA uh, able, to, able to do things they would not be able to do without the support 
from the cloud because of the spiky nature of the workloads that involves. You have researchers that in order to do the research they did, which would take months or years, uh, they would have to start with a procurement for servers. And now they can just spin up instances and their time to science and the time to knowledge is dramatically reduced. And so there's, I think there's an explosion of innovation across. I think government's always been innovative. It's just been hard. Mm -hmm. And now it's getting a lot easier. And I think with the reduction in cost um, and the reduction in the amount of, of time you'd actually have to put into doing something really innovative, I think you'll see a lot more people experimenting. Yeah, I mean, I, I would want to add something about the risk side of things that you said or the security question you asked. This, there is a flip side to this. It's because we're getting so, it's becoming so easy to do this, we also do have to have the policy and be careful about what data we're mashing up, where we're mashing it up, because seemingly innocuous pieces of information when put together has that mosaic effect. So sure. um, I, I, I agree 100% yeah. I'm behind, you know, do everything you can in the cloud and get it out there, but there, there, we still have to have that governance in place. One major, just, sure. we're all going to jump on. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. One, one thing that both panels have said here is I, I really want to highlight the small word they used. I mean, I think it's okay to start small in this space. And the idea of, you know, I've heard uh, Tony Scott talk several times about how he loves cloud because it gets you, gives you the opportunity to start anew and everything's fresh and you can move right in with a new capability and you don't have to worry about some of the legacy problems that killed you in your on-premise solution. And so do that, start small, you know, stand up a development environment in AWS, um, you know, move one application and just take that risk mm -hmm. and it, it'll prove itself out. And then it's the snowball rolling downhill and that's how innovation happens. So start small. So guys, I think we have one minute left. Can I have a profound closing statement about modernization of the government from each of you? Sanjay, would you like just, I, just a profound statement? I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I think what everybody said is, you know, we've come to a tipping point in where the federal government is. We have capabilities, we have technologies, we're assessing culture, we're looking at processes, we're moving, we're changing the way government thinks. We're looking at how the users are using our tech, our, how they interact with us, we're working with that. I think that change and that shift in thinking is what's going to drive innovation and how to modernize government. The tools and technologies, they're all going to continue to evolve. The cloud give us, gives us that platform to implement all these things well. So I think what everybody has said holds true. I think we're at a great point, a very exciting point. That was good. That was profound. <laughs> Jim, you want to take a swing? Wow, that was, that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, uh, you know, cloud is just a fantastic enabler for what we want to do and take next steps with in the federal space. Um, in order to take the most advantage of the cloud, I guess the profound thought I would have is just take the time up front to think about why you want to go to the cloud, tie it to your strategy as a business, um, know that when you migrate, you're going to have to modernize, and, and think about where you're going to land. Um, don't rush in. Uh, it'll, it'll be a game changer, but, but do it at a steady pace. That's good. Lena? Uh, start with users. Build your ecosystem. Don't give up. And just go do it. Just go do it. Just do it. Well, everyone, that was the conclusion. Can we have a round of applause for the panelists? <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I believe that uh, lunch is being served now. So uh, thank you for joining us at the Amazon event.